Gordon, let's uh, arrive in the style he usually arrives in, right? Two hours. What are you up to, eh? <laughs> oh, Lewis, never mind this professional style approach. <laughs> oh, boy. Thanks, Gordon. Thanks, <laughs> Pete. <laughs> so, as I can say to you, the star of many other parts beside tonight, oh, my Lewis God. Collins. This you really is your life. Hold on. Well, got that big way we were doing it before. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, the theater's just down the road, Lewis, and we're going at a slower rate than Pete, if you don't mind. But we've got a lot of surprises for you there, too. <laughs> Lovely. Once again, my thanks to stunt arranger Pete Braham and, of course, Gordon Jackson, but I hope you've recovered more than I have. I'm from... still going. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good driver. Actually. Oh, boy, that frightened me more than it frightened you, I can tell you. And even your run down the aisle, we had to get training for that, I think. <laughs> Gordon, how have you enjoyed working with this guy and the professionals? Oh, it's a wonderful experience. I just come from upstairs, downstairs, and I was used to speaking to Rose and Ruby shivering in front of me and saying, yes, Mr. Hudson, no, Mr. Hudson, and suddenly I was confronted by Doyle and Bodie. I didn't know what had hit me. I felt like crawling through the floorboards. But he's a marvellous chap, a terrific actor, and a natural star in the soul one. I agree, and Lewis Collins, this is your life. And indeed, the last four years, that action-packed series, The Professionals, has been very much a part of your life. Here you are in a typical style scene with Gordon Jackson here and with your partner Doyle. Now, throw me the kegs. And stay looking at that screen, Lewis, because you'll see your ex-partner could use, if not a Bodie, a Sherlock Holmes behind him right now, because in the film he's making at this very moment, he's got problems on Dartmoor, as he'll explain. Coming up now, Martin Shaw. Good evening. Hello, Eamon. Hello, Lewis. How are you? I'm here on Dartmoor doing uh, the Hound of the Baskervilles again. And uh, we've got a... Thank you very much. I wish I'd beat that bloody dog. Uh, looking back over the professionals, I know a lot of the things that you and I remember can't be repeated here again. But a lot of the stuff that I remember is all the funny stuff and the, the jokes that we shared and a lot of the laughs that uh, we did share, I shall remember always. Enjoy yourself, have a good night, and I'll give you a call when I get back. Thank you, Martin Shaw on Dartmoor. <laughs> well, Lewis Collins, this is your life, and you were born on May 27th, 1946, at number six, Scotby Road, Birkenhead, on the Mersey waterfront, where your father was a shipwright. And one day, when you were just two years old, 
He and your late mother were the proudest mum and dad on Merseyside. That was when you won the most beautiful baby in Liverpool contest. Still a proud dad, your father, Bill Collins. Your fiancé, Marion Sheffield. Close family friends, Anne Francis. And the man who taught you to shoot, Tom Brassie. <laughs> and the rest of your family. Sister Val with husband John and their daughters Jane and Sue. Brother Gerald with his wife Alice. Your Aunt Irene. Your Aunt Irene and your Aunt Lila and Uncle Ted with your cousin Alan and Colin. Don't they know how to keep a secret? Yes. <laughs> Better actors than me, this lot, I'll tell you. <laughs> but, Bill, from what you said there, Lewis must have been an exceptionally bonny baby. Well, you've got to say, say that again, you know. When he was ran, walked away with that uh, competition for the beautiful baby, and then, at the later stage, the uh, photograph, it, it ran on Central Station, etc. For two and a half years, it, it was bugging Here the Here is the photograph. Here you are, future hard man of the professionals, <laughs> age two. <laughs> now, Colin, you two are, of course, brought up practically as brothers, and you've good reason for recalling that picture. Yeah, I remember that photograph. I was one of those kids that was always scruffy, and every time my mother used to take me down past Central Station, <laughs> where the shop window was with the photograph in it, she'd always say to me, look at your Lewis, why can't you look like him? <laughs> Well, Lewis, you were, you were brought up in a family atmosphere of music and entertainment because your father here played piano at local clubs and you had your own group, didn't you, Bill? Yes, the Savoy Swingers, Eamon. The Savoy Swingers. And by the time you're 12 years old, Lewis, you're learning the drums and a year later, you're up on stage at the local works club playing alongside your father. And, Lewis, didn't you pay off the 25 quid you borrowed from Dad to buy the drum kit? Not yet, no. <laughs> <laughs> it was 1959 and Merseyside was on the brink of the 60s pop boom. And you spot an advertisement by a local pop group wanting a drummer and you asked for an audition. And we got the surprise of our lives when this 13-year-old school kid turned up on my doorstep. You went to his house for that audition for the Renegades pop group 23 years ago, Neville Moore. And with them bass playing ex-Renegade, you also haven't seen for more than 20 years Stuart Leithwood. <laughs> now, Neville, you and the other members of the group were all a few years older than Lewis and thought this kid would be wasting his time. Uh, yes, we did, Eamon, but uh, he played this tune that we gave him like a dream. And we stood there sort of open-mouthed with amazement. And the result of that audition was that we went on and he joined us as the fifth group member of the group. And fantastic. For three years as mates. And Stuart, you had some fabulous times together. Oh, yeah, great times. Uh, I think until the group split up. And I think that Bob, um, I think Bob went to, I think, out to Saudi Arabia. And I think that Pete, he emigrated to Australia. Yeah, but that was 18 years ago. Yeah, it was a long time. Yeah. But I'm not in Australia tonight, my old whacker. And I'm not in Saudi Arabia, Lou, my old mate. We found them to bring the five great pals and the renegades back together for the oh, first oh, time in 20 oh, years David. from Daran, Rob Ashton. <laughs> <laughs> And from North Queensland, Keith Dunn. Thank you, the Renegade. <laughs> well, now, as a teenager, Lewis, uh, a great neighborhood pal of yours up there in Birkenhead became a rival on the pop scene with his own group. Then he, too, made a switch in his career to comedy and... Uh, if you look at that screen, he'd like a word. Freddie Starr. Hello, Lou. Hello, Eamon. Um, just come here, Lou. I'm ecstatic with it. You're fabulous, Lou. On a, a, what can...
Well, Freddie getting himself into a little trouble there. We'll, 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 uh, we'll try him later. <laughs> Let's go on, Lewis. We all know how much you enjoy the outdoor life. And you used to go on camping trips with your father to an isolated farm in Shropshire. And I know how much those trips meant to you on that farm, but boyhood day is over. You leave Grange Secondary School and get a job at Liverpool's most exclusive ladies hairdressing salon. Surprising choice of career for the later tough guy you became. What made you choose that job? I saw a sign saying hairdressing this way and I uh, thought I'd have a go. Simple yeah. as that. You had a go and you were called Mr. Lewis. And one of your jobs <laughs> with another salon apprentice was a daily check on the stock room with a particular eye on a certain shampoo. And you'd say to your pal, you thought he deserved a drink. Uh, that's right, Mr. Lewis. You'd say, I think you deserve a beer shampoo. Your great pal from that hairdressing salon more than 20 years ago, formerly Mike McGear of the Scaffold, brother of Beagle Paul McCartney, and these days successful children's writer, Mike McCartney. Mike, when Lewis told you you thought he deserved a beer shampoo, didn't you have a, a sort of standard reply? Well, in Liverpool, we used to say, get it down, yeah? That was a standard reply, but uh, in those days, it was rather more like, uh, Mr. Lewis, I think uh, we deserve a beer shampoo, if you would hold the... The, the little bottles, the little teeny bottles, right? Little glass yeah, bottles, right. little teeny ones. So you used to have to get the beer and pour it in. So, obviously, a little bit would spill over, so somebody would get underneath and sort of... Uh, just in case any spilt. <laughs> <laughs> and the procedure sort of uh, went to our heads. <laughs> it was one of those shampoos, Eamon. I understand, but it didn't stop Mr. Lewis being tops Mr. in his new profession. Indeed, when a particular top of the pop star visited Liverpool in 1962, she sent from the theatre for her favourite hairdresser. Walking back to happiness. <laughs> yes, walking back right now, Helen Shapiro. As the Liverpool pop scene of the 60s swept the nation, not only were you part of it, but your father too. Now you join the Mojos group and Bill, you became their manager. Now sadly in 1967, Lewis, your mother died and Bill, you move with Lewis to London and full-time pop group management. Then Lewis, you decide you want to become an actor. You pass the audition for the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art, and one day you're asked to step in front of the class to perform a Shakespearean speech of your own choice. And we couldn't believe our eyes, Lewis, when you bolted from your seat and out of the building. Student of that same class that day, 13 years ago, star of the hit comedy Holding the Fort, and soon to be seen as private detective Jemima Shaw, Patricia Hodge. So, Patricia, had Lewis suddenly got stage fright? Well, um, that's what it looked like, you see. He'd, um, he'd been told to go and prepare this Shakespearean speech. And uh, especially when somebody reported having seen him belt off in the direction of the Earl's Court Road. But actually, he turned on his heels and ran back into the theatre and straight onto the stage. And we all sat there riveted like this, thinking, what's he going to do? And he went straight into this Romeo speech, where Romeo's running for his life. And um, he set, it was, it was wonderful, he'd set this whole thing up thinking, give it a bit of impact, which none of the rest of us would have done, and it was electrifying. Thank you, Patricia Hart. <laughs> well, next you're going to rep first at Chesterfield, then at the Glasgow Citizens Theatre, where you first got involved in teaching drama to deaf and dumb children, which had a profound effect on you. You also start to get television parts, and in 1976 comes your first big break as well-off lodger Gavin Rumsey and the Cuckoo Waltz. And in this scene, your normally reserved landlady has been getting worried because you seem to have gone off the girls. Does Chris know about this? <laughs> that I'm in your bedroom wearing a fantastically sexy negligee and my one and only erotic perfume. That I've got his newspaper. <laughs> no. I probably think they're on strike again. Only, he always says he likes to come down in the morning and open a virgin newspaper. <laughs> it's not the same when someone's at it first, you know. <laughs> but tonight, Diane has to be in Yorkshire 
where she's filming a play for YTV, television's Foxy Lady. Hello, Eamon. And hello, Lucy, baby. Well, kiddo, they got you in the hot seat this time, didn't they? <laughs> Nothing to do with me. I've actually followed your career very closely since then. And um, I hate to say this, but I did actually become addicted to the professionals. And uh, not just because you were in it, of course, but um, mainly because you were in it. But, you know, I thought, there he is, that little devil, running around, grabbing people by the collar, throwing them around, shooting at them, you big butch thing. Oh, it's not what I expect from a decent scouse lad. Anyway, I understand that you are off to Plymouth this Christmas to do something quite different. I hear you're going to do Prince Charming in pantomime, my dear. Well, I shall have to make an effort. I will come down and see you, slapping your thighs. Have a wonderful evening. Enjoy yourself. Give my love to everybody. Big kiss for Bill, and see you soon. Bye, babe. Thank you, Dan. Keen in Leeds. Uh, just a moment, Lewis. I did promise we'd try again for a message from that unpredictable comedy character you know. I think we've got him coming up right now. Uh, boyhood pal, Freddie Starr again. Better luck this time. Hello, Eamon. <laughs> Hello, Lou. It's fabulous being here. Congratulating you, and this is your life. I've, I've always wanted. To... <laughs> Come on, Eamon. Oh well, Freddie's in trouble again. Yeah, <clears throat> Lewis. After the cuckoo waltz, you <laughs> you move to the role of that tough operator Bodie in the professionals, and you certainly don't compromise in preparing for it. You join the Territorial Army Volunteer Reserve and win your para red berry. Quite a moment, eh, Lewis? Yeah, greatest. And here tonight, the Parachute Regiment pals who helped you achieve that greatest moment, Dean Monkman, John Newman, and Chris Bridget. <laughs> And, Lewis, that tough training with your parapals here came in very useful when you starred in your first feature film, the box office hit based on the Iranian embassy siege, Who Dares Wins. Ken, you're still framing the doorway. Terry, keep your head up on target. You're still looking at the ground. Thank God it's Friday. But, Lewis, for all that tough image you present to the world, your favorite star personality in the whole of show business, the one for whom you have a real soft spot, is, in fact, a Muppet, right? <laughs> True. Gonzo, yeah. Yeah. In fact, you've even got your own Gonzo at home. I have indeed. And sometimes take... <laughs> and sometimes take it to bed with you. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> But even you never met the real Gonzo, have you? He's my hero. But you've never met him? No. Well, I can tell you he's migrated to warmer climes, to Melbourne, Australia. But for you, Lewis, the first ever Muppet by Satellite, that all-time favorite character of yours, coming up now, a history-making occasion in Melbourne. Can you hear us, Gonzo? Yeah. Okay. Eamon, Eamon, are you out there? Oh, good. Well, hello, Lewis Collins. Yes, it's the great Gonzo speaking to you. <laughs> Lewis, the first time I saw the professionals, I knew immediately that you had patterned the character after me. I mean, you've got the same suave good looks. <laughs> yeah, you have to more than passing resemblance. <laughs> well, as you can see by this phony slide, <laughs> I'm on my summer holiday in Australia. I wish I could be there in London with you to see the show. But hey, wouldn't it be great if they did something really embarrassing? <laughs> what? Yes, just a minute, darling. Um, I've got to go now because I've got a date with a kangaroo. But I just wanted to say to you on your very special day, good luck from the great Gonzo. I'm coming, darling. Goodbye. <laughs> Thank you, Gonzo, in Australia. <laughs> uh, That's great. 
Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> oh, fill it up. <laughs> ah. Oh, we knew that would get you, but... Mo oh, wait now. Yeah, really? Okay, we're hoping now for your boyhood pal from Merseyside, here in person, that marvelously zany, one and only, Freddie Starr! Yeah, just about here. Yeah, he's he's done, but I'll tell you, really, Lou, honestly. What can I think you're wonderful? Can I sit down? Thank you, Freddie. Lewis, when it comes to helping others, one man in particular has every confidence in you. That's right, because if it's in a good cause, I know Lewis will try to fix it every time, and that's a fact. Now, you couldn't have a better seal of approval than that on your charity work, because it comes from a man who has himself raised millions of pounds for the needy. Jimmy Savile. <laughs> You two, in fact, have just completed a charity walk in Scotland, haven't you? We have indeed. Last year, Lewis very kindly came up to the Edinburgh Evening News charity walk and he went so quickly that we finished joint second and so in an effort to slow him down this year, he came back and we gave him a beautiful young lady in a wheelchair to push. It slowed him down, but he went so quickly again that the girl got the first prize for the first girl home, so that was terrific. It was marvellous. Thank you, Jimmy Carter. Thank you. Well, Lewis, your special concern ever since that chance involvement 15 years ago in Scotland has been for deaf and dumb children, so much so that you even set out to learn their sign language. To them, you're truly a hero. And here tonight, representing the Royal Association for the Deaf and Dumb, and because we knew you would like them here on this special night, with their headmaster, Sidney Merrifield, deaf children from Oak Lodge School, South London, Grace, Mandy, Ophelia, Simon, Derek, and Andrew. Very bravely saying hello to you. Thank you, the children of Oak Lodge. Lastly, Lewis, uh, a memory from your own childhood. Brickyard Farm in the five-house hamlet of Eton, Constantine, and Shropshire, where you went on those family camping holidays that I know meant more to you than most other things in your young life. The woman who kept house at that farm never married, never had children of her own. Bill, she and young Lewis meant a great deal to each other. Yes. And it's a picture so. that hangs on her wall, your letters that are treasured in her cottage in that remote hamlet, from which she's rarely ventured, certainly never as far as London. You called her Auntie Doris. You haven't seen each other for 20 years, but for you she's here, Doris Wilde. Doris, it's a special night for you yeah. too, isn't it? Today, it's my birthday. I'm 71. Yeah, yeah. And, I and? I couldn't have had a better present than meeting you again. Oh. <laughs> Lewis Collins, tonight's wish is your life. <laughs>